everyone. My name is Christina Panos. I'm one of Hackaday's staff writers. Our next speaker, Rob Weinstein, is an electrical engineer who has spent 30 years designing with FPGAs, primarily in the wireless communications field. But like most of us, he was doing fun stuff on the side the entire time. Most recently, Rob reverse engineered a 45-year-old patent into a working replica of the HP 35, just in time for the calculator's 50th birthday. Please welcome Rob Weinstein. Hello, I'm Rob Weinstein. In commemoration of the upcoming 50-year anniversary of the introduction of the HP 35 calculator, I'm presenting Patently Obvious, reverse engineering a 45-year-old patent into a fully functional replica of the HP 35 scientific calculator. This presentation is about how I built a fully functional replica of the HP 35 calculator based on US patent 4,001,569. I used a small FPGA board for each of the seven ICs, each designed faithfully to what's described in 569. Together, the seven ICs comprise a 56-bit serial CPU and display subsystem that runs a calculator program stored in three of the ICs. There's no microprocessor emulation here. How I got here. In college, my trusty HP 41C calculator got me through my engineering degree. In my career, I migrated to PC-based tools and my HP 41C eventually bit the dust, a corroded flex circuit. Years later, about 2007, I bought HP's newly introduced HP 35S, a modern update of their first pocket calculator, the HP 35. About that time, I discovered a whole world of classic HP calculator enthusiasts on the web. First, I thought they were lunatics, but I couldn't look away. Eventually, I quietly became one of them. Here's a short list of the websites that sent me on my way. Eric Smith. My first introduction to reverse engineering of classic HP calculators was the work of Eric Smith, namely his Chasm Sim and Nonpareil software simulators that run the original HP calculator ROM code. In the README files included in those simulators, I read, quote, the design of the processor and the instruction set are described in detail in United States patents 3,863,060 and 4,001,569. My curiosity was piqued, so I downloaded copies of those patents and was amazed at the level of detail. I learned that 060 describes the HP 80, while 569 describes the HP 45. These two patents contain much of the same information with differences only for the specific functionality of their respective calculators. Jacques Laporte. I had come across Jacques Laporte's website some years earlier, but I hadn't yet been bitten by the classic HP calculator bug. I've since learned that Monsieur Laporte had passed away and his website fell into disrepair. Lucky for me and for classic HP calculator aficionados everywhere, Eric Recklin, proprietor of hpcalc.org, had rebuilt and rehosted the site at the link shown here. Other than the 569 patent, this site is the single most comprehensive source of technical information about the HP 35 calculator available anywhere. Peter Monta. Peter has physically opened the original HP 35 ROMs and through optical methods, extracted the raw bit array and converted it to a list of machine code instructions. Tony Nixon. Tony has a trove of classic HP calculator information as well as an emulator and various reproduction hardware for sale. His notes on classic calculator operation is a fantastic resource for the classic HPs in general and their display operation in particular. David Hicks HP Museum, a great resource for all HP calculators. I've been lurking on their forum for years. HP 35 background. This is the HP 9100A, HP's first desktop scientific calculator. Its basic architecture was designed by Tom Osborne. Its machine coding was done by Dave Cochran. This product was the result of significant contributions by many at HP. With the 9100A finally shipping, Bill Hewlett asked Dave Cochran, when can I have a 9100A that fits in my shirt pocket? Dave Cochran was the project leader for the HP 35. This is not his picture, by the way. In addition to leading the project, he used his experience in the 9100A to develop the algorithms and write the microcode for the HP 35. 
The HP 35 was introduced in early 1972 for $395. That's $2,500 today. Their first 100,000 unit production run sold out in two months. The amazing 569 patent. As I mentioned above, I was surprised at what I found in the 569 patent. I was expecting a quaint collection of special purpose logic circuits that directly implement the arithmetic functions. To my surprise, I found that the calculator is a portable battery operated microcomputer running a scientific calculator program. I was amazed at the level of detail in the patent. There are block diagrams, logic diagrams, schematic diagrams, timing diagrams, flow charts, instruction tables, operating instructions, and even a complete assembly language code listing. 569 is a gold mine. Just so there's no misunderstanding, 569 describes the HP 45 calculator. There's no patent specific to the HP 35. However, since the HP 35 is a subset of the 45, 569 has everything I need to reverse engineer the HP 35 hardware. Here's a sampling of the images. Here's a sampling of the 37 figures in 569. Here's a sampling of the 77 or so tables in 569. And here's a sampling of the 28 pages of the HP 45's machine code listings in 569. In addition to plentiful figures, tables, and code listings, the text describes every aspect of the calculator's operation, the basic machine architecture, the five-wire serial, bu serial bus that connects the main ICs, a precise detailed description of each of the ICs operation, the energy-saving inductive drive technique for the LED display, the complete instruction set, a switch mode power supply, and even the keyboard, including details of its over-center or fall-away feel. And I'm just gonna point out a few items here. In the middle, I show figure two, the main block diagram from the patent. And then within that figure, I have circled with colored boxes, the different blocks that make up the calculator. And then the, the patent goes on to expand each of those blocks into larger block diagrams. And then behind each block are many paragraphs of text that describes exactly how it works. So how does the HP 35 work? Those of you who are students of computer history might recognize this as the block diagram of the computer that von Neumann described in section two of his famous 1945 paper, first draft of a report on the EDVAC. This is now called the von Neumann architecture. Let's compare this to figure two in the patent. At the top is von Neumann's architecture and at the bottom is figure two from the 569 patent. As you can see, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the von Neumann architecture and what's described in 569. It's clear the HP 35 is a computer. After reading the patent, I fell in love with the HP 35. Why? Because of how much they did with the resources they had. For example, there were no microprocessors available when the HP 35 was designed. Intel had launched their 4004 just three months before the HP 35 was introduced, HP had to design their own processor. Static memory was too large and power hungry. They had to use dynamic shift register memory instead, implemented in PMOS. And since all the registers were shift registers, this forced the designers to employ serial processing throughout. It could be carried in your shirt pocket. Because it was small and portable, it had to be battery operated, which forced the designers to employ low power design techniques an LED display that's powered by batteries. They had to coax power hungry LEDs to only sip power. A tiny ROM, only 768 10 bit words. This required handcrafted machine language coding. The algorithms for the transcendental functions were based on the work of Henry Briggs from the year 1624. Talk about your prior art. And floating point arithmetic, 10 digit accuracy in most cases. Of all the amazing techniques revealed in the 569 patent, I only have time to talk about two of them. I've chosen the inductive drive technique for the LED display and the serial processing architecture used throughout the calculator. So much was left on the cutting room floor, so to speak. Let's get started. The patent says, quote, the inductive drive technique employed for the LED display is inherently efficient because there are no dissipative components. What they mean is no dropping resistors are used. 
dropping resistors work by throwing away power, and they can't afford that in this battery-operated pre-CMOS design. The basic scheme they developed is closing an anode switch puts energy in its inductor. Opening that anode switch discharges that energy through an LED segment. By carefully choosing the inductor value and the switch timing, the designers delivered exactly the right amount of current to light the LEDs without wasting any power. In the next slide, I'm going to demonstrate how HP engineers carefully orchestrated the timing of their inductive drive technique to multiplex a seven segment plus decimal point LED display across the calculator's 15 digits. This animation demonstrates the inductive drive technique in combination with multiplexing the first two digits of the display. First, <clears throat> first a note about the conventions I'm using. Blue lines represent current flow that builds up the inductor's magnetic field. Red lines represent current flow resulting from a collapse in the inductor's magnetic field. The thickness of the colored line represents the magnitude of the current flow, a thin line for a small current, a fat line for a large current. In this demonstration, digits one and two will display 8-8, all segments lit. We start with digit one. Its cathode switch is closed. It remains closed until all segments in that digit are processed. And here's where that switch is located. With the digit selected, the topmost anode switch is closed. And here's the topmost anode switch. Um, anyway, the topmost anode switch is closed. Current starts flowing through the inductor and its magnetic field starts to build, a blue line. Now we repeat the following sequence for each segment in the selected digit. One, close the next anode switch. Current starts flowing through its inductor, a thin blue line, and its magnetic field starts building. Two, open the previous anode switch. Its inductor's magnetic field begins to collapse, and the induced current, a fat red line, discharges through the LED segment and through the selected cathode switch. When the last anode switch for digit one has been opened and its current allowed to decay, Move the cathode selector from digit one to digit two. Repeat this sequence for digit two. As you can see, while the inductor's magnetic field for the currently lit segment is collapsing, a red line, the next segment's inductor is building up, a blue line. If you didn't quite follow all of that, then just pay attention to this one thing. Notice how the blue lines step their way down through the rows and the red lines trail just behind. This diagram is not in the patent, but I wanted to show how the inductive drive technique and display multiplexing are orchestrated within the calculator's 56 clock machine cycle. It reveals the synchronicity or a kind of harmony between every element of the design. What's not shown is that the keyboard scanning and the serial processors fetch and execute cycles all map into this timing exactly. Not a single clock cycle is wasted. This is what makes the HP 35 so amazing. Now let's look at the serial processing architecture. Don't try to absorb the details of this diagram. It's only meant to demonstrate that the register bits within the main processor components are constantly shifting to the right and recirculating. I wanna point out that this recirculation doesn't happen as the result of some operation, but rather is happening continuously. As long as power is applied, all bits shift by one position on each and every clock cycle. This means that if you wanna perform an operation on particular bits, you must precisely time when those bits become available at the rightmost end of the shift register, then steer those bits through the desired functional block, such as the adder subtractor. Paper design and documentation. This photo shows some of the binders full of design documentation I created for the project. This spreadsheet, lists most of the 45 separate diagrams I made during the course of this project. Many of these diagrams have multiple pages as shown in the fifth column. In total, I drew 338 individual pages. You'll be relieved to know that I'm not gonna show all 338 pages of diagrams in this presentation, but I wanna show a few of the more interesting diagrams. For example, display animation, barber pole timing, algorithmic state machines, this animation shows how the recirculating 
A and B registers in the arithmetic and register circuit are encoded on the A through E lines. I'm gonna point out a few details. At the top here, these, these two rows represent the register A and register B in the uh, arithmetic and register circuit. You'll notice that the values within are shifting to the right continuously. When a value reaches the rightmost end, it recirculates back to the left and continues on its way. Um, the rightmost bit and three other bits at the leftmost end all come down and, and get latched into the display buffer. There's also a buffer register for the decimal point. Um, here is the BCD to seven segment decoder. And along here are the multiplexers that multiplex all of those seven segments plus the decimal point onto these five A through E lines that go over to the uh, anode driver chip. Um, to the right are timing diagrams. These are taken right out of figure 12 of the patent, but I've added an animated overlay to show where you are through the timing diagram. And finally, at the bottom, we have the LED display. A few things to notice about that display is it's written from the right to the left, LSB first, so to speak. And you'll notice that the segments uh, are drawn individually rather than a whole digit appearing at once. This is to reduce simultaneous current draw from the batteries. Next page. In order to work out the detailed timing of the recirculating registers within the control and timing circuit, I developed a technique I call a barber pole timing diagram for reasons that will become obvious. The contents of the 28-bit register are shown as a horizontal row of boxes. At the next clock cycle, I show the 28 boxes shifted one position to the right and the rightmost box returned to the leftmost position. Each subsequent clock cycle shows the register contents circulated to the right by one bit. Since I used different colors for the three fields, a barber pole pattern emerges. And I wanna point out these fields. So the, uh, at the top here on the left is the ROM address in yellow. In the middle are the 12 status bits in green. And at the right are the eight return address bits in sort of pink. In modern parlance, we'd call the ROM address the program counter. We'd call the status bits the condition codes register. And we'd call the return address the stack. Not the stack pointer, the entire stack. The HP35 processor can only do one level of subroutine. Now that I've got all the shift register content shown over time, I refer to the patent, which tells me that the ROM address will be incremented during bit times B47 through B54. Since the bits can only be used when they reach the rightmost end of the shift register, then these bits must reach the rightmost position during those times. The patent goes on to say that the incremented address is transmitted during bit times B19 through B26. Again, bits can only be used when they reach the rightmost end of the shift register, so the incremented address bits must reach the rightmost position at those times. With this information, I can fill in the remaining bit times and the main bus signals. With the bit times and main bus signals all sketched in, the state of the microprogrammed controller can be added. The purpose of this exercise was to determine the state sequences for a particular instruction type. To determine all the state sequences, I drew 18 separate barber pole timing diagrams, each with about twice as much information as depicted here. The microprogrammed controller. The patent discloses much of the calculator's logic in ample detail. However, it's silent on the internal details of one very important block, item 46 the microprogrammed controller. Since a microprogrammed controller is an optimized implementation of a finite state machine, I decided to start by designing the state machine using the technique that Tom Osborne pioneered during his time at HP called algorithmic state machine or ASM. This is very likely the same approach that the designers of this calculator employed. Osborne's ASM techniques were collected, organized and expanded by HP's Christopher Clare in the book shown here. This slide shows my actual algorithmic state machine diagrams. At this stage, my barber pole timing diagrams showed how the bits had to move between the shift registers and the various resources to perform each instruction type. A few slides ago, I showed that I added the state signal to the barber pole timing diagrams. 
state shows what needs to be done during each bit time to perform the steps required for each instruction type. Once I had the states worked out for every instruction type, I sketched the state transition diagrams using the ASM techniques in Claire's book. The ASM diagrams fully document the operation of the microprogrammed controller. FPGA coding and simulation. To demonstrate how I performed FPGA coding and simulation from the patent, I'll focus on a small but important submodule, the serial adder subtractor item 84, as shown here in figure 10 within the arithmetic and register circuit. This submodule is essentially the calculator's entire ALU, or just AU, because there are no logic instructions in the HP35's processor. A little digression. The HP35 employs a 56-bit word size, but the data that's represented in that word are always decimal numbers. So data such as characters or binary values are not allowed. A common technique for working with decimal numbers in a binary computer is to represent each digit using binary coded decimal, or BCD for short. BCD uses four bits to represent any digit, zero to nine. There's room for 14 BCD values in the HP35's 56-bit word size, so 14-digit decimal arithmetic is theoretically possible. On the right side of this slide is the block diagram of the arithmetic and register circuit. On the left is what the patent has to say about the serial adder subtractor. Using this information, we'll try to write the Verilog code for the serial adder subtractor circuit. Since I knew a serial adder can be done with a simple full adder circuit, this should be easy. The patent even explains how. So I'll start sketching it up. Here is the full adder. Here's the register that holds the previous carry bit. And here are some multiplexers to steer the various registers into the full adder. So far, so good. Wait, what's this about BCD correction? The patent says, quote, it is not known if a correction is needed until the first three bits of the sum have been generated. So I'll add a three bit shifter on the main sum. It says, if the sum exceeds nine, so I need to compare the sum to nine. Then it says, a correction addition of six to the BCD sum must be made. So I need a second adder to add six. And here's the six that gets shifted in. The next sentence is the key. It tells me I was doing it all wrong. So I have to undo my first attempt. So get rid of this and do what it says. Quote, this is accomplished by adding a four bit holding register, A60 through A57, and inserting the corrected sum into a portion, A56 through A53, of register A if a carry is generated. Well, now I have two carries here, and here, and I still have an address subtraction. The patent only says, quote, a similar correction for subtraction is necessary. Not much to go on. I'm starting to realize this is more complex than it seems. At this point, I thought it might be a good idea to see what I could find on the web. A lot of searching led me to a paper by Glenn Langdon of IBM, published in the IEEE Transactions on Computers in 1969. This paper was a goldmine of information on BCD subtraction. I learned that typical BCD subtraction circuits using binary adders employ a method called subtrahend complementation and add 10 decimal correction. Langdon presents an alternative called minuend complementation. I'll sketch two versions. This one employs subtraction by traditional subtrahend complementation and add 10 correction. The next one employs subtraction using Langdon's minuend complementation. Of the two options, I've chosen the second version that employs Langdon's subtraction by minuend complementation because it always adds six regardless of add or subtract and the carry output logic is simpler. Using the second logic diagram, I'll code it in Verilog. This image shows the module ports. Up to now, it's all been paper design. But finally, this is where I go from just writing about an HP35 to actually making one. With this level of detail in the diagram, it's just a simple matter of coding up each related idea into a block of Verilog. Let's go through it real quick. So here's the full adder and its exclusive OR for doing the minuend complementation. 
That is coded in this block of Verilog. Um, right here in the middle is a multiplexer that sequences the binary value for six. That's shown in this little block of Verilog. Over here is the second full adder that adds the six, and that's shown in this block. Um, the two outputs with their exclusive ORs are coded up in this little block of Verilog. The carry out logic is coded up in this block of Verilog. The two uh, carry flip flops are coded up in this block of Verilog. And finally, the gate on the carry end of the first full adder is coded up in this block of Verilog. Once the module is coded in Verilog, I need to test it. Since the serial adder subtractor is the fundamental element where all the HP35's results are calculator, calculated, it needs to be rock solid. I chose to write a self-checking test bench in which I could run thousands or even millions of test values through my module. I drew the detailed test bench, then coded it in Verilog by inspection. I'll point out a few highlights. Well, this big yellow block in the middle is the unit under test, the serial adder subtractor. This block on the left is the test vector generator. It generates random values to be added or subtracted together. Those values are stored in shift registers because of course this is a serial device and I need to shift the values into the unit under test. To the right here, I have another shift register that captures the serial output. At the bottom, I have two registers here that perform a latency matching function so that the output from the test vector that their generator um, reaches the end at the same time as the actual results. And at this point in the diagram, I can compare the actual to the expected values. And if they match, I increment a good count. If they don't match, I increment a bad count. Then this little block of code um, captures all the results and saves them to a file. Here's the entire test bench. Once again, I've decided to sketch the detailed diagram of the test bench this time. It's a simple matter of coding up each idea into a chunk of Verilog. Test bench results file. The self-checking test bench compares the expected and actual results and dumps the results to a text file shown here. I print a tally of good and bad comparisons, num good and num bad. For the 1,000 iterations of random values that I ran in this test, I got num good equal 1,000 and num bad equal zero. I'd say I nailed it. But just so you know, I've also run it with over a million iterations, and I still get num good for every iteration and num bad equals zero. I use the techniques described above first to diagram, then to code up and simulate each module in the patent. It took about 18 months or roughly 750 hours to complete just the RTL design. Constructing a working replica. Once I had the FPGA code written and simulated, I drew up a schematic. I used a commercially available FPGA board for each of the seven ICs in the design. I worked out a preliminary component placement, then a final component placement, then I assembled the replica. Let's go over the details of the front side. Um, to the upper left here, we have a 1.6 megahertz crystal oscillator. The real calculator used an 800 kilohertz LC oscillator, but because I wanted to use registered synchronous logic in the FPGA, I doubled the clock rate. But the main processor clock is still 200 kilohertz, just like the real calculator. Uh, these two modules form the anode driver of output display unit 14. Um, this block is the circuit for detecting low battery voltage. These three modules comprise the cathode driver of output display unit 14. And finally, at the bottom, we have the seven segment LED output display. To the right, I list the specific parts I used. Now a detailed view of the lower part of the front side. Let's step through the circled blocks. Here's a list of the interesting parts. The upper left, we have the arithmetic and register circuit. On the left middle, we have the read-only memory circuit. So there's three ROMs in the real calculator and three little boards on my replica. At the bottom, we have the control and timing circuit. Um, to the left here, we have the power on circuit. 
And as a nod to Hackaday, I used a 555 timer. And in the middle here, we have these five brass wires. These are the interconnecting buses and lines. And I wanna make a point that these buses are individual wires. The entire interconnecting bus is five wires. Um, and of course, here is the keyboard input unit number 12. Again, to the right are the exact details of what parts I used. Of course, I also sketched up the backside, added the wiring and power supply, then I hooked it all up. Again, let's go over the details. Um, right in the middle here, we have a 18650 lithium ion cell. At the top, we have a load sharing lithium ion battery charge management controller. Below, we have a pair of step up, step down, DC to DC converters. And this whole block is a separate power supply module that plugs into the breadboard. Um, on the left side, we have the back of the cathode driver. And to the right, you can see the back of the anode driver. Note that the power supply is not a replica of the original HP35, and that my replica runs for about 30 hours on a full charge. Now here's a detailed view of the lower part of the backside. Let's step through the circled blocks. At the top here, we have the back of the seven segment display. Below it, we have the five by eight matrix of switches. And you can see I made a point to highlight the uh, matrix uh, nature of it. Um, over here, we have the back of the register, register and arithmetic circuit. We have the back of the read-only memories. Here's the back of the control and timing circuit, and finally the back of the power on circuit. Now I'll show a short video that demonstrates a few example calculations from the 50 year old operating manual. So for future goals, um, perhaps I would, I'll do a PCB version of this calculator. And what I'd really like to do is a gate level version along the lines of the Monster 6502. Now I know the Monster 6502 is a transistor level, but uh, for my purposes, I think uh, using TinyLogic uh, gate level design would be fantastic. 
And uh, finally, uh, here's some contact information, a, a GitLab, GitLab uh, repository, which is empty at this point, but I, I will be adding the files. And uh, my niece drew this picture, and you can clearly tell uh, who's holding the calculator in that picture. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.